poet Rumi once said, you are not a drop in the ocean. You are the entire ocean in a drop. It's an interesting quote in its simplicity, yet very profound in its meaning. One that is reserved for the highest levels of any given mystery school religion, where the concept is not only revealed intellectually, but experienced subjectively. The idea resembles the notion of reincarnation, that when a person's body dies, his or her soul is reborn to experience life all over again, but in a new body, which may be another gender, race, or even a different species. The theory is then expanded to mean that there is only one instance of the same life that will experience every other instance of life, separated by the illusion that we call death. To put it another way, you, me, and each of these people walking here alongside me are the same singular entity observing from every potential point of consciousness. And when we die, we move to the next to observe from that perspective at a different point in time with a new organism. Basically, infinite reincarnation into every possible life form independent of time. So. If there's any truth to this theory, then it means that death does not really exist and that we are all immortal and it is impossible not to be. In Hindu philosophy, Atman is a Sanskrit word that means breath, referring to the universal self independent of ego. And it's one of the most basic concepts in Hinduism, the universal self, the eternal core of the personality that after death either transmigrates to a new life perspective or attains release from the bonds of existence. Atman is part of the universal Brahman or absolute with which it can commune or even fuse. Many people may be surprised to learn that reincarnation is not a Buddhist teaching. There is no permanent essence of an individual self that survives death, and thus, Buddhism does not believe in reincarnation in the traditional sense, such as the way it is understood in Hinduism. That said, Buddhists often speak of rebirth, and Buddha said that every moment you are born, decay, and die. He meant that in every moment, the illusion of me renews itself. Not only is nothing carried over from one life to the next, nothing is carried over from one moment to the next. This is not to say that we do not exist, but that there is no permanent, unchanging me, but rather that we are redefined in every moment by shifting impermanent conditions. Suffering and dissatisfaction occur when we cling to desire for an unchanging and permanent self that is impossible and illusory. And release from that suffering requires no longer clinging to the illusion. Alan Watts was an English writer and philosopher Let's listen to a brief excerpt on his take on the subject. I'm merely saying that the experience of being I goes on, even if there's an interval. In Buddhism, there has never been the idea that rebirth or reincarnation involves the transmigration of a specific soul, because all schools of Buddhism are agreed on the idea that the individual self or soul is an illusion. In Maya. And they liken the process of rebirth to the motion of a wave across the surface of water. So the Buddhist would say, no soul reincarnates, and yet there is the illusion of reincarnation. And what Buddhist philosophy wants to draw our attention to is that the same kind of illusion is existing in our attitude to the physical world. We are projecting. 
Although the majority of denominations within Christianity and Islam do not believe that individuals reincarnate, particular groups within these religions do refer to reincarnation. These groups include the mainstream historical and contemporary followers of Cathars, the Druze, and the Rosicrucians. In a Kabbalistic context, the soul is eternal, a spark of the divine, and although the classic Gnostics of antiquity believed that reincarnation was a reality, like the Pythagoreans, Platonists, and Kabbalists, but their goal was to be liberated from it and return back to the true spiritual realm. In terms of Christian Gnosticism, the understanding is that resurrection can be taken as either in a spiritual context, when understood as a metaphor, or as a physical rebirth. Most Jews also seem to believe in reincarnation, along with the Knights Templar and upper levels of Freemasonry. The Templars were magicians, in particular practitioners of sex magic, and believed in transmuting the raw energy of lust into refined spiritual nourishment for the soul, which they believed could consciously survive physical death. According to Helena Blavatsky, the foundress of Theosophy, quote, If men are reborn, it would be impossible to expect an entirely new body to retain and give expression to the details recorded by a different physical brain. The idea suggested by reincarnation is that the soul, not the brain, continues to live. Those who hold the idea of reincarnation in their minds see that it brings them calm, and that the idea is sensible. Death is neither to be feared nor envied. According to Socrates, quote, I am confident that there truly is such a thing as living again, that the living spring from the dead, and that the souls of the dead are in existence. Ralph Waldo Emerson once said, quote, The soul comes from without into the human body, as into a temporary abode, and it goes out of it anew, it passes into other habitations, for the soul is immortal. Johann Wolfgang von Goethe said that, quote, I am certain that I have been here as I am now a thousand times before, and I hope to return a thousand times. Henry Ford believed that, quote, genius is experience. Some seem to think that it is a gift or talent, but it is the fruit of long experience in many lives. And then there are the plethora of cases, oftentimes put forth by children, claiming to have lived before, recollecting their former identity with uncanny accuracy, remembering who they were and how they died. One example is the case of James Leninger, who from an early age loved to play with toy planes. From age two, James began having nightmares about planes, and he would wake up screaming, Airplane crash, on fire, little man can't get out. James was able to share more details about his past life with his parents, such as the name of the pilot, James M. Houston Jr., the Navy ship on which he served, the Natoma, his co-pilot's name, and the fact that he was shot down at Iwo Jima. He would just be crying, it's an airplane crash on fire. So one day I asked him, I said, why are you signing your name James III? His response was, well, I'm the third James. It's being called the case for reincarnation. There you go. This seven-year-old boy from Louisiana not only shares the same name as this World War II fighter pilot, they seem to share the same soul. Initially, um, what caught my attention was James's extreme fascination with airplanes. James Leininger's parents don't believe in past lives but realized early on their son was unique. I took him to the Cavanaugh Flight Museum that every time we went to the area where the World War II aircraft were located, he would just stand there and point, mesmerized. He was barely two years old. Here's home video. While the other youngsters viewed the bombers with a childlike curiosity, Little James recognized the steely war machines with a certain familiarity and comfort. The pilot put them on. I said, oh, look, there's a bomb on the bottom. He said, that's not a bomb, that's a drop tank. 
that innocent trip to the museum would dramatically alter their lives and the lives of complete strangers forever. He started having the nightmares, and that was my first indication that there was something wrong. The screaming was not like a normal child crying. It was a panic-stricken, terrorized screaming. Over and over again, James had the same terrible nightmare, four to five times a week. He was too young to explain the dream, but he could draw. He started doing these little drawings of airplanes shooting at other airplanes are being shot down. It's the only thing he still draws. Bombing ships, you see men parachuting. Here's another one where planes are dropping bombs. And this is a carrier, and you can see where what he does is when he draws them, he starts with just a picture, and then he just starts drawing lines all over the place like a, he's playing out a movie. I kept thinking, where is he getting this? Uh, what's he watching on television? But I was a stay-at-home mom, so I know that there wasn't anything that he was being exposed to. Not exposed to in this life, but perhaps, just maybe, somebody else was. <laughs> Decades earlier, another little boy named James grew up in South Bend, Indiana, with the same insatiable fascination with airplanes. He became a fighter pilot for the Navy and shipped off to fight in World War II. March 3rd, 1945, during a mission near Iwo Jima, he took a direct hit, was declared missing and presumed dead. He would wake up in the middle of the night, he'd be laying on his back, kicking his feet up at the ceiling and screaming. It was almost like if you were laying on your back inside a box and you're trying to kick the lid off the box. When I would wake him up, he would just be crying. He'd say, airplane crash on fire, a little man can't get out. He said that over and over, night after night. What goes through your mind when your two-year-old says things like that. It freaked me out. Yeah. <laughs> it's like I can see in your face that it's, it's startling and it, um, um, it, it's frightening. I was alarmed by the frequency of the dreams or nightmares. This was just the beginning. Nothing could prepare Andrea and Bruce Leiniger for what James revealed next. And I remember he laid on his back and he did the same motion like he did in the nightmares. He laid on his back and kicked up at the ceiling and he goes, Mama, the little man's going like this. And he laid on his back and kicked his feet up. The little man's going, ooh, 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 can't get out. And I said, well, who's the little man, baby? And he goes, me. Where did he take off from a boat? Do you remember the name of your boat? He said, Natoma. Found uh, several thousand hits on the word Natoma. The USS Natoma Bay launched into battle, headed for Iwo Jima in the fight for Lady Golf. It's the biggest naval battle in the history of the world. Leo Pyatt served on the ship. From his home in Ohio, he organizes the Natoma Bay reunions. That's how Bruce found him. I wanted to disprove it. He asked uh, a few questions about, uh, did I know some of the people? Oh yeah, I remember those people. And uh, so he... He got uh, very uh, quiet. It was all real. The people and places James described actually existed. And remember those G.I. Joe dolls that James named? Turns out, three men with the same names, first and last, served on the Natoma and were killed in action. James said they greeted him in heaven after his crash. I'd always asked him, do you remember what your name was? And he always said James. But his name is James. Yes, there was a Jim Houston, or rather large shell. Just hit him in the, the engine and it burst into flames and, and went down. They showed Leo the drawings. He was uh, right on the nose. I'm sure, in my mind, that he was there. Leo invited James, now three, to the reunion. James recognized several pilots, even called them by name. You're Bob Greenwald. <laughs> I'm serious. And he never met Bob Greenwald. No, he never met him before. And someone else was invited. James Houston's sister, Anne. And he goes, uh, it's not Anne, it's Annie. She wasn't my oldest sister. I had an older sister than that. And I said, you did? Who is that? And he goes, Ruth. I mean, Ruth. Annie is what they called me when I was little. Knowing my name and my sister's name, the things that my brother did when he was a kid, and it's too amazing to, to describe how he would feel that, that way, but he does. He considers me his sister. But does she consider James her brother? I think it's probably a reincarnation of my brother. Anne was so touched, she gave James items from her brother's final effects. The little George Washington bust had been on my brother's desk 
all through school. I said, where's the statue? He said, I put it on my desk. As James gets older, his memories of James Houston and the nightmares are beginning to fade. But his knowledge of airplanes and his passion for flying continues to soar. The Corsair was my favorite fighter. The Corsair was fast. Agility was very good. Why him? James has never said anything about why he's here. One of God's unexplained mysteries. There are many similar cases of children recalling a former existence, such as Shanti Devi, who was born in 1926 in Delhi, India. In the 1930s, as a little girl, she started remembering her past life and began telling her parents at the age of four that this was not her real home. She told them, as well as her teachers, that she had a husband and a son in Mathura and she wanted to go to them. One of the teachers then wrote a letter to the address given by Shanti Devi to inquire about them. To everyone's surprise, they got a reply from Shanti Devi's previous husband saying that his young wife, Ludgi Devi, had passed away a few years ago after giving birth to their son. The details Shanti Devi gave were all true. The case was then brought to the attention of Mahatma Gandhi, who set up a commission for investigation. Shanti Devi took the researchers to her previous home and gave them the exact description of how her house and neighborhood looked before. She recognized her husband, Kedarnath, her sister and son. She told them details of their married life which made Katarnath believe that she was indeed Ludgi Devi, born again. The commission's report stated that Shanti Devi was indeed the reincarnation of Ludgi Devi. So, while there are many documented examples that seemingly make an effective case for the existence of an individual soul that retains memories from a prior existence in a different body, the spiritual philosophy that has been passed down since antiquity, which are now safeguarded by secret societies and mystery school religions, maintain that we are still part of the same universal consciousness and that ultimately perception regarding a separate identity are temporary and an illusion. That said, let's listen once again to Alan Watts. There is the sense of centrality in every being that exists. And therefore, every being is I just as you are. And there are always eyes in this sense. Uh, so long as the planet endures and there are living creatures on it, this is a planet which eyes. And so long as there is the possibility that anywhere in the galaxies there should be such a planet or creatures who have, uh, who focus the centrality feeling of the universe, there is I. And that I is always you. We know that when people die, other people are born after them. That is all the evidence we need for the notion of a reincarnation. All. It could be explained in various ways, discussed in various ways and elaborated, but fundamentally, People die, and then people are born. And that is only the simplest way of saying it, because people are born while others are living, and the whole collection of eye centers can sit around in a ring in this room. And I would explain, according to my feeling, that we are all a cycle of reincarnation sitting around here in a circle. Because reincarnation is the reincarnation of I. Uh, if you want it to be the reincarnation of a particular I, then you will have to do something else altogether, which we shall go on to talk about. But one thing seems to me to be perfectly clear. 
There was a time when your eye woke up. It emerged from the biological continuum and what de Chardin calls the biosphere of this planet. And you don't remember having been here before, at least not in the ordinary way. That is as surprising and as inconceivable an event as ceasing to be and uh, without any apparent prospect of being again. But you see, after this event called life, you, if you go back to unconsciousness, you go back to where you were before you started. And uh, since there can't be any experience of non-experience, <laughs> obviously, uh, any next eye that comes up, and all, in fact, next eyes that come up, are you. Only since I is an experience of centrality, you don't experience yourself as multi-centered. You experience yourself as a particular center. Because the universe, although it is multi-centered, each center is experienced uniquely. So what you might roughly expect is this, that after you die, uh, the next thing you know is that uh, you are, without the slightest memory of whatever happened before, you repeat the same sort of experience as you had when you were born. Or is it somebody else being born? There has to be someone around. I'm merely saying that the experience of being I goes on, even if there's an interval of uh, several billion years. It makes no difference whatsoever. I mean, supposing it took, supposing the human race was wiped off the planet, and it took that much time for it to reappear, or any living creature, that would make no difference to this phenomenon. So, let me repeat, since there is no possibility of a non-experience, there are always experiences coming up, and each one of them is you. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. My published work is available on Amazon and through all other major book outlets. If you'd like to support my work, you can do that through patreon.com. There should be a link in the description. Please subscribe for future updates. Leave your thoughts below. Have a wonderful weekend, and I hope to see you again soon.